with that, I'm going to ask our our illustrious former board member, Barbara Davis Lyman, to come forward. Uh, Barbara knows about just about everybody in the city of Sacramento. And uh, she was instrumental in inviting our speakers today. So, Barbara. Well, we're here to hear the two people that are in front of us. And I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Kim Nadler, Nalder, who is a political science instructor here, but she also leads an institute which uh, delves into things such as fake news, uh, trends in voting. And we hope to have her next year when there is an election. Uh, she's been before us before, and we welcome you to be here to have a conversation with our illustrious mayor, Daryl Steinberg. And I, I, I had something prepared, but I just want to say a few things uh, because we're here to hear them. Um, actually, there are uh, some wonderful things that happen, and I'm we're happy that he does have a family. He has a son and a daughter. His son became engaged this year, and so. Uh, and his wife, Julie, has been a speaker before this group. If you attended about four years ago, she shared something about being married to someone as illustrious as the mayor who loves, loves people. That when they go out to dinner, what she does is she makes him face the door. His back <laughs> is to the door so that they can actually have some time together. Uh we know that you have been that consummate politician from councilman to assembly person to uh, to head a pro tem of the Senate. In fact, the first Jewish pro tem since 1852. Yes. It's a long time. Uh, and while he was doing that for six years, he also was head of the Democratic Party for California. So, uh, but his major thing has always been with mental health and bringing mental health to people who need it. Uh, and, but I, I would like to, uh, Desmond Tutu said, politics is the art of compromise. And we learned last week, politics from Attorney General Bonta is a contact sport, but which is a little different than Desmond Tutu said. <laughs> but our illustrious mayor has also said, Mike. has also said, politics, my view of politics is that you, that most things you, you compromise on, but one area you do never, that you never compromise on is civil rights. And we applaud you for that. And thank you for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So are we sitting or are we standing? We're sitting. Sure, of course. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Nalder, Dr. Yeah. Professor. Sure, yeah. Okay. Or Nadler, as everyone else says. So, yeah, it's you know, okay. Either way, yeah. Steinberg, Steinberg. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you know. Exactly. You know, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so I've got a few questions, and then eventually we'll open up to questions from the audience. Um, so when you were first running for mayor, you not you were you know campaigning door to door as you should, and you knocked on our door, and I was like, "Honey, it's Daryl Steinberg at the door. Come on down." And um, you asked, you know, what are, what's the main issue? that you care about, and probably like most of us, I said homelessness. And a few years later, I realized that I had failed to specify I wanted less of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, well, I think you need to be precise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> um, but you know, if my ESAC uh, next door feed is an indication, lots of Sacramentans are concerned about this issue and it's very visible and continues to be so. But if we're paying attention to, to city politics, we know that you've put a ton of energy and time and effort 
into this issue. So could you explain to us what sort of the complications are that people maybe don't see and what the difficulties are in dealing with this problem? Well, sure. Thank you. It is um, obviously the issue of our time. And it is the issue that probably consumes more than half of my time. And when I came into the office, um, given my history, authoring the Mental Health Services Act and my work in the legislature and all these issues, I did believe, uh, and I said it, I created an expectation that we could in fact move the needle. I never said we would cure it. I just thought it could be better. And here's some of what I wanna share with you. It's the tale in some ways of two stories. On the one hand, uh, before I became mayor, the city annually contracted for less than 100 shelter beds every night. Over the last six and a half years now, the city contracts for and provides over 1,200 emergency shelter beds every night. Sacramento Steps Forward, which is the the entity within the city and the county that helps uh, recommend policy and does a lot of the evaluation around homelessness has said, and you go right on their website, that since 2017, the city and the county together have gotten more than 17,000 people off the streets of the city and county of Sacramento. So if that were the end of the story, we should hold a parade down J Street and celebrate all of that success. That, of course, is not the whole story. The problem has grown worse, as evidenced by the, so, the, the point in time count, which is led by Sacramento State University, and also what is evident to the people in terms of these numerous tent encampments throughout the city. And so the fact of the matter is that three people become unsheltered and homeless for every person we get off the street. Now, in 2020, 2021, during the COVID period, the city received upwards of $50 million for rental assistance for people who fell behind on their rent during COVID. We were able to use that money to help over 5,000 households, families, stabilize and avoid eviction. The money ran out and there were 5,000 households left on the waiting list. And so the complication, and let, let me add, because I never want to make excuses. I hold myself accountable and believe me, I am. I mean, people think that the mayor of the city um, has all of the tools and ability to change the dynamic that I just described to you. I would argue in my defense that I've done everything I said I would do. I brought hundreds of millions of dollars. I've led the state effort to make sure there's direct allocation of state resources to cities, not just counties. We have, as I said, opened up 1,200 plus beds. We've passed a variety of measures to both enforce the law but also to create a partnership now with the county that obligates the county to do whatever it takes on the mental health and substance abuse side. I brought all that policy forward. And yet uh, the problem has grown. The city itself is not a homeless service agency. It's not what we do. We do not do mental health and substance abuse. When I, yesterday I was on the floor of the Senate first time I had returned in a long time, to witness Senator Eggman and the Senate pass 40 to nothing, the modernization of my Mental Health Services Act, to make sure that more of the money is spent on this problem, because currently not enough of it is. I joke, but it's only half a joke. If I had known back in 2004 when we wrote this, that 12 years later I would run for mayor of Sacramento, I might have written the initiative a little bit differently. Might have sent the money through the cities so that we had a little bit more control, but we're not a homeless service agency. And so we can provide shelter. We can provide safe ground. We can enforce the law. The 
the necessary compliance to say you can't be blocking sidewalks, you can't be camping near critical infrastructure, all things that we are doing. So the result is not satisfactory. I'm accountable for that. I do accept that. I fight fiercely every day to continue to make it better, to add to that 1,200 beds, to bring the partnership with the county to life so that more people are getting those underlying mental health and substance abuse services that they need, and to do everything we can to prevent people from losing their homes in the first place. In the big picture, the city of Sacramento is not the only one dealing with this. This is every major city in California and many throughout the United States. And what is at the core of it? Let me just answer this. In my view, beware of any partisan who says it's all a housing problem or all a mental health and substance abuse problem. In many cases, it's both. What this is really about is systemic poverty. It's about the it's about the increased cost of living, high housing prices, and it's about people who have always lived in a fragile way, always lived in a fragile way. There have all been people with mental health issues and substance abuse issues, but they've hung on. And now they're not hanging on. The society has gotten less affordable. It's gotten the social compact has gotten more frayed. And more people are ending up in this situation faster than we can get people off the streets. I'm hopeful about a number of things including some of the changes at the state level over this past year where more money is going to be directed from the mental health funds to the people living in the encampments. I'm, I, I'm hopeful about the right balance between voluntary services, but saying finally that people who cannot help themselves, that we have an obligation to make sure that they can, that, that they can be cared for and that we're moving beyond some of the ideological divisions that have prevented more progress. Last point, I have long advocated and it's fallen on deaf ears thus far, but you wait, you wait long after I'm away from the scene that this will come to fruition. Ultimately, the challenge is this, in this society, we make housing people and people accepting housing, providing services to people and people accepting services, a voluntary act. There is no right to housing in California. There is no right to mental health care and treatment. There is no legal obligation for people to accept housing when it is offered. And there is no legal obligation for people to accept mental health services when it is offered. And until we say as a matter of law, that the society has an obligation to ensure that everybody has minimal dignified housing and gets the help they need, voluntary acts by government lead to mediocre results. Think about this for one moment. It's so embedded in our culture, we don't even think about it anymore. The law says every child is, is entitled to a free public education. And what do we do as a matter of instinct, policy, tradition? We build public schools. So we do. And it's not perfect. Lord knows it's not perfect. But every child has got a free public education. Housing? There's no right to housing. You either can afford it or you're lucky enough to win the supportive housing lottery, literally a lottery, to become high enough on the list to be able to afford the $400,000 a year subsidized or $400,000 one time subsidized apartment. Thousands of units, by the way, throughout Sacramento. So we say we care about this and I believe people do and people are mad about it. Government must act. And that's just a, not a moral, a cry for morality. It's a cry for enhancing the legal requirement for every level of government to house people and to make sure they get the services they need. And then, since you don't want to be ideological about it, to say that those same people, if they don't want to say yes when it's offered, the law 
must require them to say yes. So bottom line is I have no friends. The ACLU doesn't like me and neither does the and not and neither does, uh, you know, those who think it would cost way too much money to actually house every Californian. But that's what I believe. And you believe me over time. That's exactly where the policymakers are going to are going to come to, because there's really no other choice. Thank you. So you have clearly a lot of experience in state government, in the legislature, and city government as well. I teach um, intro to American politics. We do California politics in this class for, you know, freshman GE yeah. class, where I try to convince them that there are ways for them to influence what happens uh, in both of those bodies and that they can get what they want out of their government in various ways. What would you tell people in terms of how they might better get what they need and want out of their government? There are two kinds of people in politics and maybe in life that uh, uh, an old mentor once taught me. They're short termers and long timers. The short termers are those who get excited or mad about an issue. And they get involved and engaged. And then they realize there's something called the separation of powers. And, and special interest influence and inertia and human nature and all the above. And they get frustrated after a year or two because it doesn't go their way. And they decide that they are going to do something else in their lives. And they're not bad people. They just have decided to be short termers. Then there are the long timers who choose to dedicate themselves to something it could be a cause it could be uh, just being engaged it could be improving democracy or government and they choose to be in it for the long haul and they get the luxury of being able to look back over 10 20 30 40 years and say i lost a bunch i won a bunch but look at how far we've traveled over the course of uh, uh, of time. And that's what I feel about my career in many respects. I've had some significant setbacks, um, including, you know, the way I see myself now in, uh, in this role as mayor with regard to this issue that is so darn intractable, where I'm doing my very best, applying the same skill sets, the same things I've always known and done uh, to this, and yet the result isn't, it, it isn't there. But I get to look back over the course of 30 plus years and say, OK, here are all the things that I've been part of and I've done. And so for young people, for all people of all ages, that it's whether or not you're committed to trying to do your part to make it better. And I once got great advice when I was entering the legislature. And I think this, again, applies more broadly beyond the legislature. Phil Eisenberg, um, my friend, said to me, uh, hey, Daryl, you're going into the legislature for six years because that was six years in the assembly then. And I might we didn't know if I was going to have a shot eight years in the Senate, but six years. He said, don't think you're going to be able to change the world or the legislature. He said, pick one or two things that really matter that are not high on the political pop charts. Right. Not something that everyone else is is working on. And make that your North Star and focus on it. So you're going to cast thousands of votes, give a floor, million floor speeches that no one will listen to. And in the end, you will have what you chose to work on. That's how I chose mental health. That's, that's, that was the logic that led me to choose mental health. And oh my God, what 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 we have done and, and what psychic rewards it has brought back uh, to me. And so people choose. I mean, I sometimes think people are, it's like the NIMBY thing, right? Solve that homeless problem, but don't you dare put a homeless facility in my backyard. We know that that's common. Well, you know, the people hire the, the, the politicians. Yes, there's a lot of manipulation and the special interests and all that business and too much darn money and all of it. But in the end, the people have a choice too. And a person can choose 
to either make it better in their way or they can check out. And I think there's only one option. That's what I tell young people all the time. Be a long-termer. Probably, probably a few of those in this room. I, I guess. think you're all yeah. qualified. So um, I run a thing called the Project for an Informed Electorate, and we do an initiative explainer every election year down at the public library. And we have the legislative analysts come and they explain the initiatives. And then we go through the endorsements and the campaign spending. We make these streamable, vi streamable videos. By the way, this is a plug for next fall. Um, but we make these streamable videos that people can watch. And we have an event where we actually do it live. And what we find is that the audience at that event, frankly, looks a lot like this audience. And what we really wish we could do better is to reach more diverse communities, more um, people who aren't as engaged already. And this is a very diverse city. And the, the participation and the outreach doesn't feel like it's equally distributed all the time. What does the city do to try to reach out to all of the communities? A lot. I mean, one of the things I think I'm most pleased about, about uh, the last number of years and my mayorship is that we have tried and we're beginning to succeed to redefine and expand the definition of the roles and responsibility of city government. It's true that providing basic services is the coin of the realm and you have to do that well before you can do anything else. But the real work now, in addition to the basic services, is to be outreaching to the diverse neighborhoods of the city and to be investing directly in their economic and and community futures. Aggie Square is a great example. Um, this is the project where we've teamed up with uh, the University of California, Davis, and uh, the private sector and the community to create $2 billion worth of private investment to create thousands of jobs around life sciences, around technology, around innovation. And the question that was raised by the community was, are you, in fact, by doing that, going to price us out of our neighborhoods? And it was a fair question. And in fact, it led, before we had a chance to address it, to a lawsuit that I ended up mediating. Um, and, and the end result, we put $50 million into an affordable housing trust fund for the neighborhood, $10 million for anti- uh, anti-eviction displacement, i.e. if rent goes up, we now have the money to be able to cover the rent for people for a specified period of time. More investment in a requirement that 20% of the new jobs be held open and available for people living within the adjoining zip codes as a mandate, not just as a, uh, a as a hope or an aspiration. And, and so... Um, we are, I think, doing a better job um, of engaging with our communities and broadening what we consider to be our responsibility. And that is to address the historic remnants of redlining, of, of, of racial discrimination, of all of the bad practices that once defined part of Sacramento's history. I tell the story of Nat Colley. I told it in one of my State of the City speeches, not the great Nat Colley. He was the one of the first African-Americans to integrate Southland Park. Well, there was such ferocious backlash um, that um, and people didn't know it for a while when they would see Nat Colley's wife out in front. They assumed that she was the housekeeper. This is the, This is history we have to grapple with. And... We we it's okay. We only we only grapple with it if we have in intentional uh, agendas that bring that have real funding uh, backing them up to try to invest in people and places that have been too long forgotten. So some, there's some major issue areas that we often think of as being national responsibilities or state responsibilities, but end up filtering into what 
goes on at the city level. What can cities contribute to bigger picture areas like mitigating climate change or um, cultural concerns like reparations? So I'm proud that our city um, is tackling the issue of reparations. Um, we've got a whole racial equity task force and study of reparations. And we won't have the money to be able to provide individual compensation to uh, African-American members of our community, even those that were the direct descendants of slaves. But this is what I was trying to talk about a moment ago. We think we can model like with Aggie, the projects like Aggie Square, how to achieve or at least come closer to what's called inclusive economic development, that as we grow this city, and I think we finally crossed the threshold where people want a larger city. They want more art and culture. They want more, we love our kings. Uh, we want major league soccer. We want more vitality, the food scene, more industry, more job opportunity. There's a lot of you know, things that come with that, challenges that come with, but I think that's the direction that people want to go. The real question is, is that growth and that change going to be inclusive of all of our neighborhoods and our community? So we have to model what we want to see nationally. And on climate, we have a great opportunity in the next couple of years. Look, the voters now three times have rejected a developer-led sales tax proposal to fund transportation improvements in Sacramento County. Well, I'm proposing that maybe we consider doing it differently, that if we're going to ask for that kind of investment, $9 billion over 40 years, that it needs to be climate focused. It needs to invest billions in public transportation, in improving the quality and the safety of our streets, and to have a multi-billion dollar affordable housing trust fund in this county that will enable us to more quickly uh, reach the volume of affordable housing units that we need for working people, for homeless people, for people who are uh, who are without. And that's another way I think we can model what we want to see done throughout the state and throughout the country. Looking back on your career so far, what do you think or what do you wish you had better understood before you served in the legislature or before you served as mayor? Hmm. You know, um, I, I suppose I wish I had known, but I learned pretty quickly just how challenging it is. Uh, you know, the, the easiest thing in the world, this is the thing about government and the system that we have, the easiest thing in the world is to say no and to stop something. The harder thing is to actually get something done. That's the great art is to actually move forward something positive. And I think I've learned, you know, this is like a trade. It really is uh, in, you know, you think about the people who practice the trade of being a construction worker, being a politician is a trade. I, I and the truth of the matter is I, I, I tell young members this all the time. Don't think that everybody around you knows more than you know. It is a bit of a fake it until you make it business. It took me four and a half years in the legislature before I really understood how it really worked. Now, the first four and a half, I was pretty good. I mean, I was ambitious. I was policy driven. I had good bills. I knew what I wanted to do. I worked well with people, but I didn't understand it. I didn't understand how the two houses interacted with one another. I didn't really understand the interplay between budget and appropriations. It took me that long. And everybody else really were in the same boat because I ended up doing very well. Um, but you think when you're starting out that everybody around you knows more than you do. And in fact, they may be going through the same thing you are. And so I think that I have learned more. I've learned more about myself. I certainly am more thick skinned than I was when I started. I tell this story. I always remember when I, in 1994, the Sacramento Bee did a lengthy profile of one of my mentors, the late mayor, Sacramento State professor, Joe Cerna Jr., one of our favorites. And it was a great profile of him. And then they did like mini profiles 
of all of the city council members. And there I was, you know, 34 mustache, bushy hair, you know, and they did and they did the they did the profile on me and you go back and read it and 90 percent of it was just positive, positive, hardworking, smart, da, 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 and they get to the end. You know, some of his colleagues say that he talks too much from the dais. <clears throat> and I did not talk from the dais for two months after that. That's how thin-skinned or embarrassed or inexperienced that I was. And now, oh, my God, I've gone through so much in this thing, right? Through the legislature, the Senate pro tem and member scandals and horrible budgets and now as mayor and homelessness and all this that when Grasswich one of the inside Sacramento did they love me by the way um when they when they when, when they um when they say nasty nasty things about me uh, that are just completely untrue but you know that's to never argue with people who buy ink by the barrel um they 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 uh I, I maybe get upset for five minutes. I look at it and then I go on with my, I keep going. And so I've grown. We all grow. Um, and I, I think you have to have, um, I never knew whether I had a thick enough const skin or tough enough constitution to do this. The rap on me has always been, I'm too nice for politics. And I always say, first of all, I'm not that nice, but number and two, even if it's true, you can find the right balance between being collegial and being principled. And man, have I done it imperfectly and imperfect, but I, I've learned and I think I've gotten better at figuring out this trade over the course of time. You you spent your career in a you know blue dominant state in a blue dominant city, and you know we see in national politics, but also in the states that there's this awful polarization, and inability really to compromise uh, across the aisle. Do you think that you've learned some things that that might that do you have any answers to how we might uh, co compromise or reach across the aisle and can can you solve the world for us? Yeah. Well, I don't think we should reward people who are polarizing. I mean, that's one thing. It's uh, elections matter. I mean, I, I can't speak to the Republican Party and Donald Trump being up 40 points in the polls. I, I, I can't explain it because. Um, and how they moved from Mitt Romney in 2012 to that, that that's a sickness in the body politic that needs that needs to be exorcised in some way, hopefully through uh, an ultimate election result, because be, because the only way the democracy, the system can work is if you are, this is the way I say it, hard on the issues and easier on the people. It, it's it's OK to fight. It's OK to um, uh, campaigns are tough. You, there is none of it's for the faint of heart, but there is a basic level of decency and civility that if it is not practiced, we are, in fact, at the risk of losing democracy. The fact that a and the ultimate is the rule of law around the peaceful transfer of power, because nobody likes to lose. And sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. But what happened on January the 6th and what happened in the months before is truly a threat to the democracy for all the obvious reasons. Because it's the first time, at least in modern history, that that basic tenant of, okay, we're fighting like hell, but we're going to peacefully transfer power where it has been decided has been questioned. And uh, and yet, what's the choice? It gets back to one of your earlier questions. Do we give up? Do we withdraw or do we stay in there and fight for it? And knowing from our history that we fought a civil war, that the Ku Klux Klan was once ascendant, 
that we had um, uh, laws barring Chinese immigrants from working here, that we interned Japanese Americans, that we fought a terrible, divisive Vietnam, unnecessary Vietnam War, that we that that huge portions of our country uh, were divided and did not allow African Americans to use uh, public facilities. That segregation was the law of much of the land. Onward, 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 and we've overcome not to where we have solved anything, but we have overcome and in some way strengthened. When I was a junior assembly member in 1998, I remember the divided Democratic vote and the hysterical debate over whether or not domestic partners should have hospital visitation rights for their loved ones who were sick and or dying. That's what I remember. I was a proud yes vote, by the way. Um, always, because you don't compromise civil rights. Um, but that was div divisive. And now, marriage equality is the law of the land. And and even, and it will never go back. It will never go back. Because this next generation, they don't, who cares? People are people. Love is love, you know? And it's beautiful. Um, so progress happens. It does happen. And so you have to, but we have to fight for it. None of it is ordained. I mean, January 6th could have gone the other way. And then where would we be? But here's the thing. It didn't. And it didn't. Let's keep going. Okay, we have time for some questions from the audience. Do I see some hands? Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Sigurd Voth, and I'm a journalist. Hi, interviewed you. Yes, yes, I have. And you've always been a strong voice on mental health issues. And the passage, as you mentioned, of Senator Eggman's SB 326 was extremely significant to update the Mental Health Services Act that you authored uh, 20 years ago. There are also several other bills, the companion bill, uh, AB 531, which is the governor's bond issue, and, and also SB 43, which is the first major change in Latterman Petra Short, really, since it was passed in 1967. So what do you do you think we're and these were near, nearly unanimous, bipartisan, significant funding. Um, do you think we're entering another era? Here. Yes, thank you. I think we're entering a more hopeful era. You know, it is maybe the old cliche about the pendulum. Why did I get engaged in mental health in the first place? Because I always say that people may not know much about California history, but they know this. That Ronald Reagan and the Democrats, because it was bipartisan, made the well-intended decision to shut the state mental hospitals back in the 1960s. And they promised that the money saved would follow people into the community and build a decent system of key mental health care. In fact, I went back when I did Prop 63 to the old archives and I saw the typewritten Department of Finance report from 1967 and the LPS Act. And it said, we... Uh, commit or anticipate, I forget the exact word, that 90% of the money saved would go into the community. And of course, it never happened. That was why the Mental Health Services Act was such an important foundation, now generating $4.5 billion a year now. The problem has been that the system was never funded, and in some ways, the illnesses integrated with um integrated with these terrible drugs and substance abuse have made people sick i mean so sick that they can't avail themselves of help even if it is offered now i always say the thing that bugs me about the involuntary commitment issue not that i'm against it i'm for laura's law i'm a strong supporter of senator eggman's conservatorship reform bill i just don't think it should be the center of the debate all the time to me, the debate should be about how we, how, how I don't know whose phone that is, but how, how we establish a, how we establish a system 
that actually provides people the help they need on the front end so that you never get to the, the point where they need that kind of involuntary help. And the pendulum swung too far. And so now it's swinging back because it's not right what's happening on our streets. It's not right. And so I believe we are entering a new era where the pendulum swings not back to state hospitals because we should never go back there. But the bond, for example, there's three pieces of this. There's Mental Health Services Act modernization, now four and a half billion dollars spent more purposefully on wraparound services, on housing, and on prevention and early intervention that is proven to work, like early psychosis identification and intervention for teenagers to avoid that, that break and that pathway towards jail homelessness. Too many kids on the street, by the way, including foster kids. That was one. 531 was the bond, separate from the modernization or 5.2, 6.2 billion, 6.4 billion dollars to actually create the capacity to build more beds. Everything from voluntary board and care kinds of places to some form of community facility with more security. I'm going to call it a locked facility. Okay. Not hospitals, but the whole continuum because we need those beds to go with the services. And then finally, Senator Eggman's conservatorship bill updates the Lannerman Petra Shaw Act in a way that I think is more about common sense and reality. The law already always has said if you're a danger to yourself or others or gravely disabled, that you can be conserved. Well, it has not been interpreted that way. Because I don't need I don't need a PhD to know that somebody talking in themselves out on that street who's half naked and shivering is uh, is a danger to themselves. Don't need to, who, who believes otherwise? And yet we're not applying the law and we're not allowing family members and or, well, we're not allowing more people who come into contact with these folks to be able to file the petitions in the first place. So that's going to change. None of these are magic answers. But what I hope is that the combination of all these tools and the additional resources and the systems performing the way that they're supposed to, which is to have a sense of urgency, a sense of organization, cities and counties working together, organized outreach teams, data, full transparency in terms of how many people are being helped and where. Now here in the city, digress for just a second, if that's okay, my great frustration, I have many frustrations, but one of them is that the problem is so large that we cannot tell people in, a, in any given neighborhood when we are going to get to their problem. And I think that needs to change. In other words, if, if somebody, if your neighborhood is 25th on the priority list and we can't get to it within th until three months, you may not be happy with that, but you sure as heck will be happier knowing that there's a plan to get to it than not knowing whether or not we're ever going to get to it. So I'm trying to bring that sense of mission and organization to this. And I think that's what the state's trying to do. Take all these tools, put them together and better serve these people. And it won't bring the result you want, we want, unless unless we keep people who are housed and fragile housed. Remember, it's the people entering into the system that is causing us to have to chase our, our tails, so to speak, because they're becoming homeless faster than we can get people off the streets. But I'm not giving up. Keep working on it. And I think this is a better era and a new era. More money and more common sense laws that say nobody should be living in that condition. I think we have time for one more question, maybe two. I saw a hand coming up over here. Oh, okay. Many people may not believe that this is the most important thing, but I, I'm so grateful to have this opportunity. I've spent a lot of time at the Capitol supporting animal welfare legislation, and I learned 
from the people with me there that you're one of the greatest supporters of animal welfare legislation. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Pets are treasured parts of most families. Right over here? Including mine. So, um, Mayor, wh where do you see the future of Sacramento? Where do you see our, our city going? You mentioned some cultural things. We have a new museum, the Museum of Science and Curiosity. Yeah. Um, and it's only partly, there's only, it's, it, there's, it's sparse. There's not, last time I went there, there's not very many exhibits. The exhibits that are there are very good. But so I think, but that's a real plus uh, is that museum Crocker, of course, but um, just where, and there's the rail yard, there's K street mall. Yeah. Can you make any, can you comment on those? Oh, I, yes. And I, I, I say this not just as because I'm the mayor and I'm the chief cheerleader for the city of Sacramento, but I really see the future as bold and bright for the city. I do think we have made a decision collectively, even if not everyone agrees that we want to be a bigger city. We want more. We want more art and culture. We want more fine food. We want more job opportunities for our kids. We want more sport. We want more uh, uh, ability to access the natural resources here and that we're going to continue to grow. The rail yards is a great example. I mean, the rail yards was dormant for how many decades for a lot of reasons. And now Kaiser's going to build a major hospital. We have hundreds of housing units. Uh, we're going to have a major entertainment uh, venue there. We've got a huge three quarters of a billion dollar courthouse, state county courthouse going up. And we're still in the fight for major league soccer. You better believe it. Um, not giving up on that one. We actually have an investor. It's been public and, we um, and they are very committed. The question is, can we negotiate something with the league? Uh, because the franchise fee has gone from seventy five million dollars when I became mayor to now five hundred million dollars. So um, we are not paying for that. Um, the public is not. We're contributing infrastructure and those sorts of things in the rail yards. But whether or not we can come to a reasonable negotiated uh resolution with the big league that you know it's not helping us that this guy messy in miami is uh is boosting their tv ratings but uh we'll see okay. sacramento deserves it and more okay thank you so much uh professor nalder thank you to the renaissance society thank you barbara thank you to everybody i four more years steve uh <laughs> i I'm so honored that you would ask me to come to speak to you. I just have greatest regard for the for the Renaissance Society. And thank you for having yes, me. Yes, and thank you. We, as a token of our appreciation to both of you, we are offering you a one-year membership in the Renaissance Society. And yes, you're old enough. Yes, oh, come on. <laughs> and also, we make a contribution in your names uh, to the Seth Nelson Emergency Care Fund. Wow. So, but in addition, well, in you. addition, uh, something that you probably don't know about is that the Renaissance Society is really internationally famous for our gift wrapping. Looks like the way I gift wrap. <laughs> and these these are cookbooks. Are uh, Mary Ellen stand up? Um, Mary Ellen Burns has been very instrumental in putting this together. Yes, yes, you have the. There, you'll find the signed one. Is that it? One of them. One of them is signed. And we we would also like to present you, Mayor Steinberg, with this this. Uh, copy from one of our members. This is uh, something you may remember, a Sacktown magazine oh, yeah. from 2016, 2017. And I would like to point out, there's a wonderful article about you and you look much younger. But, yes. <laughs> so my, we- This was my first year as mayor. Not yeah. <laughs> we thank you so much for all the hard work you do for us and Professor Nalder, thank you for the wonderful questions.